right, so the idea behind this trial was looking at progabide as a treatment for reducing the rate of seizures in epileptic patients. And yesterday, as I was finishing off, I kind of made a couple of points about this plot. One of the points I said was, I don't think that this plot is very honest in the sense that baseline is on a different scale from the week two, week four, week six, week eight. And what I mean by that is baseline is the total number of seizures that are being recorded on patients over eight weeks, so four, four, four weeks long, long period, okay? So if you were gonna produce a plot like this, a much more meaningful way to do that would be to standardize these things, okay? You would standardize them by two weeks, so they're on the same scale, or standardize them by a week, maybe average number of seizures per week, okay, within patients. That's one thing I would say. Yaron actually asked, though, he said, well, looking at the plot, does this mean that there's no difference in the treatment effect between progabide and control? And you know, truly, you, you might jump to that by looking at kind of where these medians are and saying, well, the lines aren't that different. Um, but I would say that you don't really want to take that message away from this particular plot for a couple of reasons. One is because of the change of scale, you don't really get good resolution. Right? So that's what you're doing. Two, obviously, is there's variation. Three is am I looking at the within subject or cross sectional? Number of seizures. These are cross sections, right? So these are marginalized within within treatment arm at each particular time point. So there's nothing on here that tells me how Susie changed in terms of her number of seizures over time. And that's the benefit again of having the longitudinal measures, is I can actually see how a particular patient, once I give them treatment, is starting to change in their number of seizures. Okay? Now Generally speaking, in a trial like this, if you had a within subject change, you would probably see a marginal change. Put that out there, but they're not the same. You don't necessarily have that. Okay. The way that you could have a within subject change and not a marginal change is if you had a subpopulation for which you were affected, and another subpopulation for which you were affected, and they might marginal. Um, so, so a couple of things about this. So, so then the follow-up question to that, which after I explained that to you, Ron, which is a good one, is well, we can actually produce a plot like this. So I would argue that if you standardize these things, it's still a good plot to have because it gives a reader an idea of again the marginal number of seizures that you have. That's really kind of driving your information in, in the study. So, so it is a good plot. But if I were writing it in a report, I would talk about the fact that it's a marginal estimate, not a within subject change estimate, and that's what we're going to ultimately be analyzing here. You know, it's really good. So, so it has utility, it has meaning, um, but you don't want to overinterpret it too much. So those are very good questions though about the plot. So thank you on that. If anybody wasn't here yesterday, I've got three extra lecture ones. Last one costs 50 bucks. Supply and demand. All right. So now, we went through five different motivating examples. I talked about how correlation would arise in those five examples. Part of what you saw on each of them is that the correlation, the way that we formalize it anyways, is partly driven by knowing what the sampling scheme was in each of those. So that's, that becomes extremely important here, right? So if I'm talking about the periodontal tooth loss, knowing that I'm actually sampling the entire mouth on an individual and then doing that repeatedly over time is extremely important. So now that drives the fact that I've got spatial correlation across the mouth, and I've got temporal correlation longitudinally over time. If I'm talking about um, the wildfire data, knowing that I've got zip code level data means that I've got now spatial correlation across zip codes of both that are closer to one another and more likely to be similar to one another for multiple reasons, right? Think about things like socioeconomic status, general health status, exposure to other pollutants that you didn't necessarily measure, right? We measured only PM 2.5 in that particular example. Um, and then again, knowing that that was actually a time, if you will, a time series over days, that we actually measured the rates of it. So again, as you're starting to think about the sampling scheme, you gotta think about how that's inducing particular correlation. Okay, other questions from yesterday before I get rolling? Okay. Um, so today I want to take a couple of minutes here, which may end up being the entire
our discussion. We'll see. Um, and motivate for you guys the utility of using correlation to your benefit or possibly having it serve to your detriment in some cases, depending upon the type of study guideline that you use. It also gives me a chance to kind of introduce to you guys common terminology for study design as well. So the first one that we're going to think about is what we would call a classic repeated measures design. And so in a repeated measures design, what that means is that you are sampling the response for an individual repeatedly under the same intervention, if you will, for lack of a better word. Okay, so you're not changing the intervention with inside of the individual or with inside of the cluster of the sampling unit. Okay, that's what we mean by repeated measures design. Um, you're repeating the measurement on the same environment, if you will. Okay. And so in this particular case, let's assume then in a simple case that I'm going to take two measurements on individuals. So my response here is Y. So YIJ is going to denote the ith individual shape response. J is going to run from 1 to 2. I is going to run from 1 to N. And then we'll just put it in a context here. We'll think maybe about a treatment or a placebo, because that's easy. We'll think about a binary space where we have an intervention. Okay. So again, what I'm going to observe is that on, say, the first N subjects, I'm going to reorder folks with that loss of generality. But on the first N subjects, I'm going to have observe their responses when x is equal to 0 both times. Okay, Again, repeated measures design. For the next n subjects, so n plus 1 up to 2 in for my index there, I'm going to observe their response when x is equal to 1. So, for example, under the intervention case. Okay. And just to make this a little simple for us, we're going to assume that the variance is homoscedastic. So, in other words, constant variance across both subpopulations and across both measurements. And that the correlation is also what we would call exchangeable. What I mean by exchangeable is that correlation rho does not depend upon i or it does not depend upon j. It's always the same. It exchanges across everybody and every measurement within, within someone. Okay? All right. Good, good, good. And so now, a natural contrast then that we might have is to say, well, I want to know if there's a difference in the population means under individuals is under treatments versus individuals under placebo, right? So a natural estimator in these cases is under placebo. What I'm going to do is I'm going to sum up all of my observations. I'll divide by 2n. That's the total number of observations that I have there. And then under uh, treatment, I'm going to sum up all of my observations and divide by 2n. They're not going to be in so let's quickly think about the variance in this case, and then we're going to compare this with a couple of other designs that we might consider. Did you guys go over to SST first? Oh, okay, good excuse. We should have went with that one. Just go yes. We were, we were in the same room from last quarter, didn't realize it. They're on time, hands folded, <laughs> waiting patiently for the lecture to begin. All right. So variance under the repeated measures design. Subpopulations. Well, I've got independence across individuals. So that's going to be the variance of mu hat, mu one hat, plus the variance of mu zero hat. So that's nice, that's easy to do. Now, if I look at the variance of this particular guy, well, I'm just going to pull out a 1 over 4 n squared. That's coming from the 2 n that's dividing each of these guys off at the beginning of the day. And then when I look at the variance of the two observations, I'm going to get the variance of the first observation on a subject, plus the variance of the second observation, plus two times the covariance. 
right, of that subject. So what that's ultimately going to be then is I'm going to have a 2 in sigma squared plus a 2 in rho sigma squared. So this guy right here is going to be an n times 2 times the covariance of yi1. Say the first observation on the i subject and yi2. Second observation on the first subject, on the i subject. Okay. And so I will also, of course, get a 4 in squared times same thing since I've assumed homoscedasticity and constant rank across treatment arms on both of those guys, right? That's my total variance that's sitting here. So do a little work on this guy and some simplification, and what you're going to get is sigma squared over n and a 1 plus rho at the end of the day. Okay? So again, rho is that within subject correlation on the repeated that there because now I'm going to talk about a different design and we'll see if we can use that correlation to our benefit. This is all being filmed by the way, Tina, so watch your language. Oh and uh, you know you can go back and watch this too. <laughs> After the quarter? So when the video will be available? Uh, we haven't figured that out yet, but yeah. we'll we figure out. You're going to have to get like, some yeah. sort of release for the videos to come to realize this, right? You're going to have to do lots of watching out of people. <laughs> well, yeah, we'll figure it out. I'd like to have my face blurred out, actually. Can you guys <laughs> make my voice like those FBI informants? <laughs> 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 I'd like that as well. Okay. All right. Probably make it really easy to understand what you're saying then, too. It might, actually. It might. It'll probably be clearer than what it sounds yeah. right now. I'm going to remember that comment. <laughs> All right. So the next design, which is a classic design, is what we would call the crossover design. Okay. So the idea behind the crossover design is you attempt to try and use the same sampling unit as their own control to some degree. Okay. Why would it be good to use the sampling unit as their own control? Think about it from the types of adjustment variables that we talked about back in 2.11. By the way, all of these are special cases of linear regression, right? They're two sample problems. Yeah, so what's the benefit of non-adjusting? You, you are in some sense adjusting for so many things, but you're doing it by design. Right. Well, because the factors that affect this person, they're well, mostly the same except for the treatment. So basically, we're getting rid of some variance. Exactly. And in particular, you're accounting for all precision variables that remain constant within the subject over time. You're, you're controlling for them by design already. You're matching on them effectively. And you're also doing that with confounding, although you can have temporal confounding, right? If something changes over time, and you, you can't really measure somebody instantaneously under two different conditions at the exact same time, right? What do we call that? I call I just probably defined that for you last time when you talk about okay. having that contrast. It's causality, a special type of causality though, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The counterfactual, right? It says, if I were able to observe the same observation or that I had the response on somebody at the exact same moment in time under two different conditions, and then I can compute that contrast. That's what we would call the counterfactual, right? That's the difference in those things. Um, so you do, you will always have some aspect of potential temporal confounding, right? If things change from when I take my first measurement to when I take my second measurement, then I'm going to have some sort of impact potentially on the response that's going to occur there. But things that are what we call time invariant that aren't changing over those two times, we will be controlling for them by design in the crossover. So the classic way that we might do this is we might say, okay, well, suppose that each subject is, is observed twice, and we're going to observe a response, for example, for some folks, the first n of them after I've rearranged them under placebo, and some folks under treatment, and then the, the next folks I'll observe first under treatment and then under placebo. So if I were thinking about this type of design, think about it in terms of a treatment, for example. What, what types of things might you worry about with this design, though, before we get into statistics and variance and things like that? Dropout? 
You might worry about dropout, certainly, because it's going to take over time. Um, what if my treatment has a lingering effect? Right. So, yeah, so that's going to be a problem right here, right? Because what's going to happen is I'm going to bleed over, supposedly, you know, in my response into, into the control population. You got one left back, or two, two left back there. Okay, let's see, good. Um, so, what you want to do in such a design, the thing that we would worry about is we would, we would call it a washout period. You want to have a sufficient washout period that you can basically assume that somebody has come back up to baseline. In other words, under their steady state after they've been treated in that case. The other thing that you want to do is to avoid problems with potential washout periods is you want to randomize people to a sequence. And you don't want to treat the first in subjects. I have them arranged here after I've arranged the data, but in design you wouldn't want to take the first in subjects, treat them on treatment first, and then placebo next, and take the second in subjects and go back the other way. The reason why is because that'll start to confound with maybe learning effects on how the treatment works. It could start to confound with the washout periods and what you're seeing in folks. So it could be problems all the way around. So. Those are just kind of general principles if you're going to do a design like this um, that you would want to consider. Okay. These types of designs, sometimes they get used in education and economics. They become very, very difficult, though, in those cases, right? How do you unlearn something that's happened, right? So people try and use it, but it's like, eh, I don't want to go down that route, right? Once you start to alter a process, and even in medicine, you know, you hide behind it, right? I mean, there's oftentimes very, very long-lasting treatment, you know, effects on biomarkers and things like that that are coming from treatment. You can say something has a short half-life. That doesn't mean that it's completely gone in terms of its effect on the system. So, yeah, you've got to be careful. But when you can do them, they're wonderful. All right. Um, so, I, one, one thing that wouldn't be a temporal crossover design, I, I can't help myself now, we do use this sometimes, so I've used this type of design thinking about eye treatments. Oops. Okay. So if you think about treatments for the eye, oh, now it's not a temporal change. What I can do is I can randomize the left eye or the right eye in a person. So I can actually see them at roughly the same time. Okay. Now I've got a left eye, right eye, potentially compounding that might occur, but um, so it's not the exact same eye all the time, but you can do that. And in the early days, well, actually, they still do it now, but like for topical treatments for like skin disorders and things like that, they randomize people left side of the trunk and right side of the trunk into particular, say, topical steroids. Yeah. So it can come up there, and it, it becomes a very nice design. Okay, so again, if I'm thinking about comparing the population means between treated and control, then our treated and placebo, I'll use that terminology here, um, then what I've got now is a natural estimator for the mean under placebo is just going to be the first in observations for these folks here, the first observation on the first in subjects, and then uh, the second observation on the last in subjects, the way that I've defined my particular notation here. And analogously, I'll define mu one half in a similar way, where I'm now crossing those things up, taking the second treatment on the first in folks, first response on the last. So let's look at the variance of this particular guy, and then compare. Let me make sure I get my index in the right. So now, under the crossover design, I'm going to have variance mu1 hat minus mu0 hat. That's the contrast that I'm still interested in. That's going to be 1 over 4n squared. Now where I've got independence is coming between the groups, of course. So I'm going to take the first n subjects, a yn1, or sorry, a yn2. That was under treatment, minus a y. I1, that's under placebo, that's for the first in subjects. And then once I've rearranged this guy, I'll have a sum now of I equal n plus 1 up to 2n. Uh, now this is going to be YI1 
minus yi2. Again, this is under treatment for these last half of folks, minus under control for those folks. And I forgot something here, didn't I? It'd be nice to have the variance floating around in here. Thank you. So, okay. So now if I take my variance through again, I've got independence between the subpopulations that are sitting here. Well, when I look at this first guy, I'm going to get 2 times sigma squared for each of these n terms. So I'm going to get ultimately an n2 sigma squared. And then now I'm going to get a minus 2 times the covariance, right, on each of those within subject terms. So now I'll have a minus n2 rho sigma squared. And then that's going to be for the first folks. And for the next folks, I'll have the exact same thing. like so. And if you simplify that guy out, then you're going to get a sigma squared over n and a 1 minus rho, right? So that 1 minus rho is the idea of using the precision by controlling for the within subject characteristics on the same patient. So now, let's suppose for a second just jumping ahead in the, in the notes here for you guys. Let's suppose the design now where I just take two in independent observations within each group, right? So in other words, I just recruit four in people total okay, into my study. I don't do a repeated measures, I don't do a crossover and try and use the same subject as here. If that's the case, then you're going to have variance mu1 hat minus mu naught hat. This is just going to be the sum of all observations divided by two in for those in the treated group. This is going to be the sum of observations divided by 2n for those in the placebo group. What you're going to get then is a sigma squared over 2n plus a sigma squared over 2n, which is ultimately going to give you a sigma squared over n, right? So again, this is 4n total subjects in this case, sampling units, right, that are independent across those groups. So that's just me moving on. So what we see is a couple of things, right? Sampling design really is going to affect what our variance and our precision is going to be at the end of the day, depending upon whether we have correlation within clusters or not. And in particular, this type of design, would you expect positive or negative correlation within subjects? People tend to be more like themselves over time. They don't usually kind of revert and change to be exactly the opposite. So you're looking at this particular case as being a much more efficient design depending upon how that correlation is going to arise. Okay. Here, you will lose information if you had a positive correlation right, within subjects relative to having four in total subjects. What's lurking behind the scenes here, of course, is that this would be my precision over here if I had four in total subjects. In other words, two in independent observations. But here I've only needed to have two in total subjects, right? So you have to think about the cost and study design of what is the cost of a new sampling unit, an independent sampling unit, versus what is the cost of a repeated measure on an existing sampling unit. So classic examples would be in my field, it's a lot easier to remeasure a patient that's already consented inside of a study than to go out and recruit a patient to screen and to bring them into a study. It's a lot cheaper and it's a lot easier in time consumption and everything else. So it's a lot easier to get two in total subjects or sampling units than four. Okay, in that particular case. Same thing would be true if you were, for example, considering clusters being classrooms. It's a lot easier to remeasure the same subjects that are already in the classroom that you brought into your study than to bring in a whole new classroom right on top of it. All right. So that's the logistical considerations that you've got to have in the study design. Okay. So 
take home message again for us as we're kind of going through. Oh yeah, I don't have this nice automatic button anymore. You gotta go manual. Or how barbaric. What's that? It's how barbaric. I know it is, you know. I mean you would think that at this point they would treat me a little bit better, but you would think so. No, just me. I just just me. Just me. I thought that's why you took the chair. No, I, I took that because I like pain. Um, okay, so the take home message is again, dependent data will change the precision of the estimate. If you do not account for it, if you take the usual sampling variability under independence, clearly your variance estimate is going to be incorrect if, if rho is different from zero okay, in those two cases. And then finally, dependent data can either increase or decrease the precision of your estimator. It depends upon the direction of the correlation that's occurring with inside of clusters. And it also is going to depend upon the underlying study design that one has used. In other words, the ability to contrast within or between the subjects. Okay. Right. So we will look at that much more closely in regression context as well. But that's really kind of the clearest example of seeing it just in a simple two-sample quote-unquote problem. Okay. So let's look at one more example it's going to ultimately kind of lead to, if you will, the intuition behind the regression models that we're going to consider. And you guys have really been doing things like this already, I would argue, but this is going to put it in the context of correlated responses with inside of clusters. Okay? So really what I'm getting at here is saying, what is the role of weighted estimators when you've got correlation inside of your data? Okay? So a classic example might be a case where you've got what we would call grouped binomial data. So in other words, with inside of a cluster, I've got the total count of number of successes and I've got a total number of trials. Okay? Could be thinking about passing 211, given that you're inside of 211. Okay. High probability of success there, by the way. Um, or not. Okay? So the number of successes I'm going to denote as YI on the I cluster, NI the number of trials. The classic example that I gave earlier would be the teeth extracted inside of each mouth. You might maybe think of that as binomial, where I take the total number of quote unquote successes being two plus divided by the total number of teeth that I have to begin with. Okay. So suppose that we wanted to use data from, say, little m groups here, and we wanted to estimate a quote unquote common probability of success. In other words, it's the marginal probability of success across the populations. Okay. Now, if you think about the tooth example problem, Clearly, there may be a differing underlying probability of success with inside of each individual, right? And that's part of what we wanted to get at in that study, was like trying to observe what the treatment effect was, for example, across this was. But we also might want to be interested in estimating a marginal probability of success. In other words, on average, what's the probability of losing teeth, right? So I'm looking partially at Monticello because, right, we can, we can estimate marginal parameters. That doesn't necessarily mean everybody has the exact same probability of success, but the marginal still means something to us. It means something on average what's happening for probability of success. Okay? That's part of the problem she's working on. So two natural estimators that we might consider then if I want to talk about a marginal probability of success in a binomial setting like this is I could say, well, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take and I'm going to sum up the total number of successes I have across all sampling units, and I'm going to divide by the total sample size within inside of each of those sampling units, okay, the number of trials. That's one estimator. Another estimator is to say, no, what I will do is I will estimate now the underlying probability of success within inside of each sampling unit, yi over ni, and then I'm going to average those things. Both of those very natural estimators. It turns out that both of those are in fact consistent estimators for the marginal probability of success. As long as m is going off to infinity, the total number of independent units, and as long as the amount of information on each of those units is also going off to infinity. So these things have to go up to a constant in either work in. Okay. That's the way we would write that. Okay. Now they would not necessarily produce the same estimate though, of course, on, on a given set of data. If you had empirical data, there are two different estimators of that common probability of success. Both consistent under that condition, um, but not necessarily the same. So what we can do though is we can say, yeah, but they really both belong to a much larger class of quote-unquote weighted estimators, right? And they look like 
weighted estimator is where I'm weighting the sample pro uh, uh, proportion with inside of each of my uh, sampling units by this WI, and I'm dividing through by the sum of the weights. And if I wanted to get back to theta hat one, what I would do is I'd take my WI to be NI, that would cancel out, I'd just get the sum of the YIs over the sum of the NIs. And if I wanted to take theta hat two, that would just simply say, give each of those independent sampling units the same amount of information. Or the same amount of weight, sorry, thank you for that information. I'm leaving myself here. But the same amount of weight as we okay. All right. So, it turns out, you know, if you want to think about, well, which estimator should I use then, which is optimal in terms of efficiency, well, you can basically appeal to Gauss-Markov, right? These are just weighted averages. So Gauss-Markov already tells us that you're going to minimize the variance of the weighted average if you weight by the inverse of the variance of the random variable that you're summing over. Okay, and in, in samples. That's Gauss-Markov right at the end of the day. So what we want to do is we want to think about what, what is the variance of yi over ni, and in which case would we be better off with theta hat 1 or theta hat 2. Another thing I want to I want to I want to strongly word letter on this Kyle, are you keeping this down? I want I want the boards that can pull up and down so I don't have to erase all the time because that would help. Well, you do have boards on the side of the room. Yeah, yeah. that wouldn't work well for you guys. <laughs> Is this about your ease or our ease? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's mutual benefit. What, whatever makes me happy is going to make you guys happy. <laughs> 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 All right. So let's consider this guy. So we want to know about the variance of yi over ni. Okay, that would in sampling unit. So if I've got truly homogeneous data, in other words, I have the exact same probability, I've got the same correlation structure across everything, in other words, everything I can assume is independent if it's all homogeneous, then this guy is just going to look like a 1 over ni squared, and then what I'm going to have for yi is I'm going to have now just an ni times a beta times a 1 minus theta, right? So, let me just make that a little bit easier for you. How's that? Okay. And so, that's just going to get me back to my good old binomial variance here. So, I'll put a theta, 1 minus theta, over an i, where that theta is constant. Everything is perfectly homogeneous, right? So, with inside of the cluster, I've got these independent observations, and then I've got an i down here. Okay, so, now, if I think about the variance of yi over ni, you guys are not allowed to look at your slides right now. If I take the inverse of that guy, it's going to be approximately ni theta 1 minus theta, which is going to be proportionate to ni, right, off by a constant in that case. So if that's the case, then which of those underlying Estimators do I want to use? It's from Gauss Markov. Which one has a weight which is approximately in I, or that is in I? Data hat one, right? So. Gauss Markov tells us that theta hat one should be more efficient than theta hat two. Okay. And 
that starts to make sense because it just looks like I've got a bunch of independent Bernoullis that are running around. So my best estimator is the MLE, which is going to be sum up all of the YIs, treat them all as independent, divide by the total number of trials that I have. Okay, so it goes back to that theory as well. Okay. That's again under perfectly homogeneous data. Okay. So now, I'm just going to jump the next slide for you guys. That's slide 1.41 for you guys. Now suppose that we have within cluster variation, okay, our correlation, sorry. So that if I look at the correlation now between, say, yi, I'll call it, I used my notation, and the notes j and yik. So two Bernoulli, or binary responses, I'm sorry, on the same sampling unit, the i sampling unit. Let's suppose that that thing is equal to rho, okay? That's for, obviously, j not equal to k. And now let's look at the variance of yi over n i. Now, if we're going to think about gauss markov okay, I'm going to get something that looks like 1 over ni squared again, this constant just popping out the back, but I'm going to get an n times theta, I did it again, times 1 minus theta times a 1 plus an ni minus 1 times a row. Okay, where does that come from? This comes from the fact that if I look at the variance of yi now in this case, well, let's see, yi is the sum of all these indicators, right? These things that are Bernoulli. So I'm going to get a total in this case. Oops, I should have had an n on there. Sorry about that. I'm going to get a total in this case, let's just write it out, sum i equal 1 to ni, yij. I'll get the first ni of them, which is going to look like an ni times a theta times a 1 minus theta, that common probability of success. That's just coming from the Bernoulli. Okay? But then I'm going to have the covariance that's occurring across these guys. And what I need to do is I need to count how many of these things I have in pairs, right? So it's really just my n choose 2. So I've got ni, ni minus 1 over 2 unique pairs that are going to occur. And then I'm going to get 2 times rho times theta times 1 minus theta. Again, that's just the covariance. So that's 2 times the covariance for any particular pair, j not equal to k. All right? So now... Some nice things happen there. I'll go ahead and pull out now the ni theta 1 minus theta, and that thing's going to get left over with the 1 plus ni minus 1 times a row. Okay? So a couple of key things. Obviously, having correlation with inside of the sampling unit is going to change the variance of that individual um, estimate of the sample proportion. So that's what you would normally have for the binomial. You divide it through by n squared, you get theta times 1 minus theta over ni. So now we've got this extra additional term, and if rho is not equal to 0, then that term is going to pop up inside of there. Okay. So now, if I take this particular guy up here, uh huh. So if I'm looking at this guy, then. Suppose now, for just a second, let's see here. Suppose for just a second, I want to think about the optimal weighting scheme in this particular case that's sitting up here. Now, what do I got? Yeah, actually, good, good. Day. Could we go back a little bit uh, about this, yeah, to, to the left side of the board, just to, like, could you clarify a bit um, 
the argument behind the like how we define the most efficient in this case. So how exactly do we apply Gauss Markov to show that? And how and how so exactly Gauss Markov would say if you take a weighted average of independent random variables, then the optimal weight to minimize the variance, you just take the derivative by the way, okay. is going to be one over the variance of each of those terms. Yeah. Okay? So yeah. these are the terms that I have inside of my weighted estimators, my theta hats. And so the inverse of this guy, this is a constant now, right? Is basically just going to look like basically something proportional to the sample size inside of each one of them. Okay, so Gauss Markov would tell me then that theta one half of just taking my sample size to be my weight in that case is going to be the most efficient. Okay, so again, RC, it, you know, it's Gauss Markov really applies in the context of linear models, but that's what it's saying. Okay, and if you wanted to show it to yourself in just a linear term, just take the derivative of the variance, and you'll get you get the same versus the variance exactly. okay. that comes out. So, good question. And there, and, and this multiplication by n i, uh, yeah, it just looks confusing because this is not multiplication. It's just I'm sorry, that's proportional. proportional to, oh, okay, that's proportional to. I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. So you, uh, I, I do have a little. Uh, that, that's less like an alpha. It serves lots of purposes in this class. So you got to keep them on these functors. Give me an X. I'm writing quickly. So now let's think about this guy for just a second. Suppose that rho is heading towards one. So in other words, my correlation with inside of the sampling unit is getting higher and higher and higher. So in other words, with inside of the cluster, things are behaving for more and more similar. Then this variance is going towards what? Well, this multiplier goes to an i. It's going towards something that's roughly constant, right? Yeah. So something that's proportional to a constant. So as rho is getting larger and larger and larger, which of those estimators should I probably be choosing? The second one, right, which says just give them all equal weight as I'm going through. You guys with me on that? You guys see where it's coming from? It's basically so I'm getting an ni squared on the top here. Okay? And so theta hat 2 isn't going to be the most optimal in terms of it's not weighting by the inverse truly of that, but you can start to see that there is this paradigm that says, yeah, you start at 1, you start to shifting the weight over. And giving just taking the average now of each of your individual estimates of the sample proportion as rho is increasing. The reason why that's going to start to matter for us is if you know you can think about this intuitively, right? I mean, if I want to think about a common probability, and I give you a bunch of binomial samples, group binomial samples, some of them have four trials, and some of them have four hundred trials. You can estimate a within unit as probability there, right, for each one of them. Do you want to just simply average them, giving them all equal weight? Probably not, right? You probably want to give higher weight to the one that has 400 trials with inside of it because you have a more precise estimate of what it is. If you truly believe that there's a common probability that you're estimating. Okay. All right. Um, so that's another way to think about it as the sample sizes are starting to Changed across these units. Yes, sir. Could we say that when rho within these groups is growing large, we're basically getting only one sample from each group? As, as rho is going towards one, that is exactly what is happening. You, you are getting no additional information off of a repeated measure that's occurring within several populations. That's the And so in that case, then they all basically should have equal weight regardless of whatever their sample size is. Exactly. And we will, we're going to talk about that concept more and more and more as we go on through the class because there's something like when you deal with correlated data, we call it the effective sample size oftentimes, right? It's not the total number of observations that I have. It's how much statistical information I'm getting from each sample okay, or each observation. Okay. I think it was back in 2011 where I gave you guys my example of you know, somebody coming into the office and saying, oh, I've got 30,000 observations. And then took me about five minutes to realize that it was 10,000 observations on each of three graphs. Mm -hmm. So their sample size is not 30,000. Their effective sample size is somewhere between three and 30,000. And if they want to make a statement about the population of rats, it's a whole lot closer to three than it is to 30,000. Like 3.1. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
that's their effective sample size. They gain a little bit of information off of the repeated measures of the new track, but they don't gain any independent information. Oh. And going back to the point there, Arsene, is the amount of information they would gain is going to be dependent upon how similar the rat is with themselves. Like, in other words, if I keep measuring and I just get the same response back, a correlation of one, I'm not going to gain any information on this. Okay. So, take home messages for us. Hopefully this has been some reasonable motivation for you guys. Longitudinal and correlated data are going to arise frequently in your guys' career. You're going to have to learn to deal with correlated data in some context for the most part. Repeated measures is going to allow us to address the quote-unquote within cluster effects. This is from the scientific perspective. This is the most important part of this. It's being able to assess the, the effect of, say, an intervention, a code rate, whatever the case may be, within cluster versus across subpopulations, as we've always done. Okay. That's huge for us. And if the data are independent, then we've already seen that if I were just to assume independence, I'm going to have different variances. So, you know, depending upon what that correlation is. So if I just assume independence, if I throw my usual GLM techniques at something where I've got correlation but I'm not accounting for it, my variance estimate is going to be incorrect. It's not going to be consistent, which means that my inference at the end of the day is going to be invalid, which means why am I doing what I'm doing? That's what you should be asking yourself. And then finally, the choice of the weighting or the estimator is going to A, depend upon the scientific question. Are you talking about it within subject change or between subject change? It'll depend upon the study design. You saw that in the case crossover versus repeated measures. And then ultimately, it's going to depend upon the covariance of the measurements as well as the measurement uh, the variance, right? So it's that sigma squared and rho that I had in the previous example. Um, that's obviously going to impact those weights. OK. Any questions on that? Uh, a four minute, we can get through all of 211 review in four minutes. So that. All right, so let's do this guy. I'll just briefly kind of introduce this so I can jump into it next week. Sure. Well, you didn't cover that much in 211, you forgot you. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was barely, uh, barely worth a mention, as they say in base factor world, right? Barely worth a mention. but I wasn't counting on the crew showing up today. Uh, they're online, and, and if you guys tell me that you're going to come in the future, then I will bring that to Okay. So, tomorrow I'm pretty much going to fly through a lot of this because, hey, you guys just spent 10 weeks dealing with it, but I want to go through it primarily because I want to emphasize this concept of over dispersion that we're going into, okay, as we get through things. Um, so, my plan, just to, to set the stage for you guys, is to go right back to the exponential family model. You don't have to follow along so much right now. I'm really going to be introducing what I'm going to be doing um, as of tomorrow. We'll go through the exponential family, and then I want to take things in terms of the context of the Progabide trial, okay? And so that is the Poisson regression trial that we've been dealing with. And for that trial, of course, that was a repeated measures design, but we're going to think about just a couple of models there where we're just going to consider the mean number of seizures at the fourth bottle of visit. So it'll be independent data in that case, right? We're not going to think about the, in, the intervening measurements that are going to occur. We'll, we'll extend to that a little bit later. So we're going to consider, uh, if you will, change from baseline model, we're going to call it, where we're going to adjust for the baseline number of seizures on a patient, and then we'll adjust also for their age in this context as well as the treatment. But as we do that, I want to run through, we'll get some model interpretation down. Um, but at the end of the day, we're going to get left with something on that Progabide trial as we run through, where if I sum up my squared Pearson residuals and I divide by n minus p, the residual degrees of freedom, I'm going to get 2.48 if I were to have assumed a Poisson distribution for those counts. 
if my assumption of a Poisson distribution for those counts was right, this is just a hot quiz for our 211 folks, what would I expect that number to be approximately close to? One, right? Because the variance of those squared Pearson residuals should be approximately one. The V of mu on top should cancel out with the V of mu on bottom. I will go through this again tomorrow as well for you guys. Um, and they have mean zero. So when I take the average of those squared Pearson residuals, I should get approximately one. City. Okay. So what this is telling me at the end of the day, and this is going to set the stage for where we're going to go kind of in the, the next week or two, is to say, ah, my assumption of a Poisson distribution for those number of epileptic seizures, those counts, is wrong. And in fact, my observed variance is about two and a half times what it would be if I assumed that it were just Poisson distributed. That's not a good thing. And you don't want to go forward with an analysis like that. You are basically assuming you have two and a half fold more information than you actually have. Okay? So we're going to kind of step back, though, go through the general theory, kind of redevelop this. But I told you guys, and I wasn't lying, when you're dealing with count data, you 99% of the time had better expect to see over dispersion, is what we're calling that. In other words, that the true variance is overinflated relative to a Poisson distribution. Okay? So we have got to learn how to figure out how to deal with that, and then we'll figure out how to deal with it for a full covariance structure as we go through the class. So, all right? Okay. Thanks, guys. Uh, homework is up. Alex, both sides of the slides are up. Oh, and I forgot to apologize to you guys. Yesterday, my watch was actually 10 minutes slow, so I had no idea I was actually 10 minutes over. You guys, like, you should, somebody raised a hand on me. So like, Dylan, you know, it's like, I think Bailey was like, I gotta go. I'm leaving, man. I gotta go. I didn't actually realize I was over, so I apologize. So I, yeah, I, I was thinking, I'm like, I got 10 minutes left, man. That's great. <laughs>